But what is happening today is feeding into it. And trust me, the more this happens, the more you will feed into it. And what's worse, my friend, if in this particular context, a takeover happens, you will see an ultimately polarised Malaysia. So, YB Said Sadiq has just recently announced that he'll be leaving the unity government because he just can't tolerate with our DPM's NDAA case itself. So because of that, many people in the internet are actually saying that he's a crybaby, you know, he want to get some attention. Maybe he wants to use this as a political bargain chip? Basically, what's his intention? Or does he really stand so strong on principle? You know what? I'm dying to find out myself. What's his plan actually? And why did he even make this decision? Let's go. Hi YB. How are you bro? Hey. Wow, there's a lot of food. <laughs> Come, some breakfast before a long day in the parliament. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've already eaten bro, but okay. All Coffee right. again. Let's eat a little bit. Huh? Can, can, can. So we got a lot of burning questions for you today. Sure, no problem. I look forward to answering each and every one of them. <laughs> Alright, so today we are here uh, to have a breakfast with you, YB, uh, and I understand it's going to be a very busy day. Everyone will be catching you during parliament, asking you all sorts of questions because you made this shocking decision to leave the unity government as a party under MUDA. Yeah. And that was something that no one really expected. They followed up with it, right? Mm. Yeah, and it came as a shock when I saw it in the news as well. Yeah. I think there are a lot of dying questions mm. right now that a lot of people want to get answer from. So. Let's just give a very quick one. Why do you even come out with this decision to actually leave the government? It's uh, nothing personal, but it is a matter of principle. I remember in 2020, when Malaysia was rocked by the Sheraton move, I fought tooth and nail against my ex-mentors, including the party which I co-founded, Bersatu, because they were the prime movers of the Sheraton move. I say it's not right to put aside the people's mandate, but more importantly, to work with kleptocrats because I believe that will be the beginning of the dropping of criminal corruption charges. And um, surprisingly, then no corruption charges, or at least the major corruption charges, uh, were not dropped, even by the former two prime ministers. However, today, 47 corruption criminal charges linked to the deputy prime minister were dropped at such an early stage, despite the fact that it wasn't a court who decided, it was the government's appointed uh, DPP and AG who made the decision to drop those 47 criminal charges. And this is at the end of the case, very close to the decision being made. Can you imagine there are tens of thousands of other people who go through the criminal process, brought to court, decided in court, but this sends a message that if you are powerful, you have political leverage, you can get away scot-free. You threaten the government, you get out. And I think that's not right. I will be the biggest hypocrite if in 2020, I made the move to speak up, fight all the way to the point that I rejected a ministerial offer, rejected the chairmanship of GLCs, got my family and myself threatened, uh, but I still fought all the way. Why suddenly today, when this happens, am I playing safe and say, oh, it's okay, back then it's okay, I can be principled today, never mind, I'll be unprincipled. It is not right. And to me, that is the red line. How many more red lines should there be? This is not just about abandonment of reforms or slow-paced reforms. I mean, if something as big as this, and mind you, it is reported all across the world, right? Name whatever media, whether it's Reuters, South China Morning Post, Straits Times, name it. It is unfortunately a tragedy for Malaysia because it sends a signal that Malaysia is a complicit in corruption, that Malaysia is not ready for transparency and integrity, that the so-called reform government at first instance, despite not being pressured, immediately decided to drop 47 corruption criminal charges. Right. So, so to me, that is the red line. So for, for I believe for many of the mass public, um, they also need a little bit more understanding of what's so different between this case mm. for uh, Dr. Zuri Zahid Amidi versus like uh, Tan Sri Muhyiddin's case, which no was dropped. And recently as well, Dr. Sri Bung Mokta's case was oh. dropped as well, right? Fair. Yeah. So why you didn't make noise in any of that? But when sure. it comes to this particular case, what's so different about it that requires you to make such a drastic decision? Yeah. Allow me to differentiate all three. And this is where it's very important to follow the case and to abide by the rule of law. Okay, let's go to Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin and Dr. Sri Zaid Hamidi. I've always been a supporter of the rule of law and allowing the judiciary to play its role. So in Datuk Sri Zahid's case, the decision was not made by the judge. I need to say it again, it was not made by the judge. It was made by the appointed AG and the newly appointed DPP, the prosecutor. 
Mind you, the old prosecutor, who is this brilliant lady who already reached the point of prima facie, therefore uh, there's enough evidence to lead to the accused yep. to file in defence, she was suddenly removed and put into early retirement. And then when a new DPP came in and a new AG came in, and during that particular period, suddenly the 47 criminal charges were dropped. To a point that the judge, a rapid mind, that the judge said it in court, you are wasting the court's time and taxpayers' money because it has come to the end of the case. The court cannot decide because according to the constitution, the attorney general has ultimate discretion on who to drop or who to charge. So this is a government decision. There's no two way around it. It's not the judge, it's not the court. Allow me to differentiate with Bong Mota and Tan Sri Medina. People said, oh, Al Sadi will definitely whack Bong Mota because he's also Amno and on the other side. Why didn't I do that? Bong Mota's case was decided by the presiding judge. It wasn't a case in which Bong Mota sent in a representation to get the cases dropped. No, it was the judge who decided to acquit Bong Mota. Mm. Similarly, in the case of Tan Sri Mudin Yassin, his case hasn't even started. If you follow his case, no prima facie hasn't even started. He filed a case in court and then the judge said that the charge was defective, there are problems and the judge acquitted. Right. And now the prosecutor is appealing. Right. And he will go through the appeal process. Why is it different from Datuk Sri Zahid? Allow me to share. This case has been going on for about four to five years. Four to five years, my friend. Yes. More than a hundred witnesses have been called. Thousands of documentations presented. Prima facie established, which means that the accused must enter defence because there is enough evidence. And after entering defence, immediately after the change in government, and this is where I call it a scheme of things, you have to follow it. Before last elections in November, and anyone's watching this, please go on YouTube, you can look it up. Datuk Sri Anwar made a statement in public that he could have become Prime Minister during the exchange in SDs. Remember before Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri became PM, there were exchanges in SDs. He could have become Prime Minister, but he didn't because the demands put by Datuk Sri Zahid then were for criminal charges to be dropped if he mm. were to become Prime Minister. Mm. Right? Okay, so that statement was made. Fast forward. After election, he made Datuk Sri Zahid the Deputy Prime Minister. To me, that's already one red line, but okay, never mind. I mean, as long as cases continue, the rule of law is still there. And then after that, Datuk Sri Zahid postponed his case from time to time. Many times. I mean, to an extent, excuses were made because he's the Deputy Prime Minister. or oh, there are cabinet meetings, there are this and that. So the utilisation of the Deputy Prime Minister's post or as an excuse. So not only was it postponed, then came in the representation after representation to get the 47 criminal charges dropped. That's already what's going on here. And then suddenly, the prosecutor, his prosecutor, who successfully established a prima facie case, was suddenly put into early retirement. Right. It didn't stop there. <laughs> then halfway in, the Attorney General got his contract extended. And just when the Attorney General went on early leave or holiday, before the transition to the other new, newly appointed Attorney General, all 47 criminal charges were dropped. Mm. You can follow that track and mind you, that decision was made by the newly appointed prosecutor and at the same time, it was made by the government. Right. Because the Attorney General, my friend, is placed under the Prime Minister's office. It is under the institution of the Prime Minister. It answers mm. directly to the Prime Minister, so much so. And I have to thank friends from the media when media probed the Prime Minister on this, saying, did you interfere? The Prime Minister even live said that the Attorney General came to see me many times. He was briefing me about the case. He was telling when is the right time to drop. I said, oh, this is not the right time. This means you can look it up. It's on national television. It's online as well. This right. effectively says that the Attorney General answers to you and is subservient to you. If you have no role, no interference in the role of the Attorney General, why are those interactions still taking place? And you said it. And not only are these hidden interactions, again, according to Malaysia's democratic structure, which I want to reform for good, the Attorney General answers to the Prime Minister. Right. So, the issue right now is this, where compared to other different cases, it was the judge that made the decision to drop it. So, basically, you enter your defence, judge finds you not guilty and yeah. acquits you. But in this very case itself, the issue is... Everything was already going in. You are yeah. supposed to be entering a defence and right. we have already called a lot of witnesses and everything. But suddenly, you who originally charged the person, yeah. you changed the guy Correct. and then suddenly and then coming in released. and then you drop the charges out of the blue. Correct. That's, right. a, that's a great summary. Allow me to sh just um, strengthen my point here as well. Last year, people may forget, 
that there were, I think, in the 30, 40 criminal charges on Datuk Sri Zaid Hamidi. This was on the visa corruption scandal. In court, the judge decided to acquit him. This is in court. That's a different corruption scandal, not this one. Yep. The judge decided to quit. I remember then, the media came to see me. Sadiq, what is your view? I said, being a law-abiding citizen, I respect the role of the judge. If there's anything, there could be an appeal filed by the prosecutor, but I'm not here to lambast the decision because you can read the decision of the judge. If there are any errors, you appeal. Now I see there are cyber troopers out there saying, oh, Sadiq is a hypocrite. Back then, when Zaid got acquitted, at the PN's time, he said, okay. Now not okay. Hey, brother. I mean, read the case. The judge acquitted him then. This time around, the newly appointed prosecutor and the government are the ones who drop the charges. Big difference between acquittal by the judge and the dropping of charges. Two huge, bagaikan langit dan bumi right. of difference. So what we can see here is, can I safely say that if this time round, it was actually acquitted by a judge Correct. instead of uh, AG dropping the case, you will be fine with it. Correct. I have to. I can't be a hypocrite by saying that I respect the process, but the, on the other hand, don't. The problem today is the process was botched. It's clear political interference. It is a political decision and there's no two way around it. And definitely with the string of events, when you have observed all this, yeah. it, it can't help but to feel like there's something that's going on there, right? right. Yeah. Whether it's there or not, I'm not really sure. Yeah. yeah, not in my position to say, but it can't help but to feel that way. Now, let's move on to the aftermath of this decision, right? Yeah. When you were thinking about this decision, it was definitely a struggle. Yeah. It's not easy. You fought the hoops to get in together with uh, Pakatan Harapan during the last election as yeah. well, right? And now making a decision to just leave, mm. right? What were the struggles that you had to deal with? It was very tough because this is a decision driven by principles. Because if people want to look from the perspective of pragmatism, as many have argued, this is political suicide. Yeah, and many would have said that, like, you fought so hard to get in. Whatever you tried to build, you are literally yeah. tearing it down yourself. Yeah. But I mean, how much longer do we sacrifice principles for political convenience? Especially being someone as young as me. I'm only 30. If at a very young age, I'm already willing to sacrifice principles for political convenience, then um, I just don't think I... I mean, this field is, is, is for me. Because politics is about service. It's about changing the country. And I'm not willing to make that call. Above and beyond that, I think it reminds me of what happened in 2020. I remember then many people said what I'm doing is political suicide as well. Just take that minister's post. Yeah. Don't reject it. After I rejected the ministerial position, just take that GLC post. It pays more than a prime minister's salary. That's just not right. You say that is the end of your political career because the party which you helped co-founded now will sack you. I said, let them sack me. And I was sacked. Mind you, I built together with other co-founders of the party for years. And I was sacked. And then I became an independent MP in Parliament. They said, that's the end of my political career. But with God's intervention and people's support, last election, I was given another chance. And this time around, people said the same thing. That's the end. No more. Even though this time around, I'm not losing my ministerial position because I have none. Not GLC positions. But it clearly shows that for me, country comes first. Country comes first and must always come first. I mean, I remember watching and listening to the late Lee Kuan Yew when he spoke about building Singapore. He said, in order to build Singapore, you will need to have the iron in you. If not, you have to give it up. And that's true. I mean, in politics, especially when politics is the epicenter of change and power, if you do not have it in you, just give it up. It's okay. And one day, I will reach that stage. And I'm ready for that. That's why win or lose, it's not the end of my life. Heck, people forget that before I entered politics, I mean, I got a chance to further my studies in Oxford, Masters in Public Policy with scholarship. I pushed that back twice each time half a million scholarship. There are many alternative routes I can pick up. Politics is not my bread and butter and will forever be my bread and butter. So if I am destined to lose, it is perfectly fine. But I'm more fearful of losing my principles than losing an election. With this in mind as well, there are also many people who actually raise this question, right? The fact that you leave the government right now, it leaves the current unity government a little bit more vulnerable. Right? And people are saying that, why not just tolerate with it and, you know, keep stability for the greater good, right? Mm. Yeah, there's a saying that literally goes, uh, some of the comments I get, they say, it's better to deal with the devil that you know than the devil that you don't know. So, 
I mean, I, stand on this. I never knew that tolerating corruption is right. Under that logic, everyone in BN during Najib's era should have just tolerated corruption because the alternative was the devil you don't know because we've never had a change in government. But people had the moral courage to vote for change. And mind you then, people say, I mean, in terms of economic development, Malaysia was decent. Not to say it's the best, but it was decent under Datuk Sri Najib Razak. But corruption was what uh, broke the camel's back. Above and beyond that, wouldn't I be the biggest hypocrite? In 2020, that was exactly what people told me. Hey, just suck it up. Just tolerate. It's not that the government is dropping criminal charges. They're not. They're still following, the, 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 they're allowing the court to decide. Heck, then, the corrupt were not even appointed into cabinet. Today, they are appointed in cabinet. Not just appointed, criminal charges dropped. Then, they were not. But yet, I still fought. Wouldn't I be the biggest hypocrite today if I suddenly just muzzle my mouth? Forget my principles, while in 2020, I fought hard for it. But put all of that aside, can you just imagine what message we are sending to Malaysians and young leaders in Malaysia? To young politicians, aspiring politicians, we are saying that effectively you have a get-out-of-jail-free card as long as you wield political power, you bargain with political masters, you kiss their hands and you, you're good. You can steal and pilfer to the tunes of hundreds of millions. It is okay. Forget your taxpayers' money. Forget building schools and hospitals. Forget about giving scholarships to those who need it. I will steal your money. And then when I get caught, I get dragged to court for five years. At the end, I'll just negotiate with those in power. Let me go and I will support you. <laughs> Done. Is that the kind of message you want to send? Imagine what investors will think or future investors will think. I mean, where does that place them? I'm just listening to the economists today and how, what they're talking about this. It is, it is a sad, sad day for Malaysia. And the fact today, I see people normalizing it. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Strategy, oh, it's okay. Oh, this is real politic, it's real politic. Yeah, yeah. You see real politic? In the future, when more and more politicians steal and pilfer to the tunes of billions, I want to see you say the same thing. Right. I remember uh, I was listening to uh, KJ's podcast, Kalos Kejap, mm. and he coined this word, reform mati. What do you think about that? The reason why that was coined, and I think it's right, because the same day where the 47 corruption charges were dropped was the same day to celebrate Reformasi, or the day of Reformasi, the beginning of Reformasi. And that's why it's there. I mean, you have to put it this way, right? I mean, just forget partisan politics. You are the average Malaysian who went through the days of Reformasi. What is Reformasi? It's about institutional reforms, decentralization of power, strengthening people's institutions instead of political elites. And then on the celebration of Reformasi, 47 corruption criminal charges were dropped because of political convenience and power. Same person who gave you support so that you can have a majority in government and at the same time, true political institutions getting charges dropped. I think if that doesn't show the end of Reformasi, I don't know what more. I just want to answer your... There's one other part of your question which is about strategy. You said, but wouldn't this weaken the government. So I think it's out. I mean, let's not forget, the government has 148 MPs at first, and now they have 147. I mean, they have a huge majority regardless. And I have already gave my commitment. If they table bill, bills on reforms, I will support. Heck, when I fought for three reform bills when I was a minister, I didn't have two-thirds support. Our majority was much smaller than the government's majority today. I still get to pass two-thirds majority reform bills. It can be done, and I will give my support. If it means about amending citizenship laws to help mothers, I said I will support. Separating the role of the AG and prosecutor, I will support. Limiting the powers of the Prime Minister, two terms, I will support. Name it, I will support, don't worry. But for me to be a complicit by doing nothing, when one after one of red line is broken, can you imagine what signal we're also sending to the government of the day? The signal is, and that's why I keep on saying, I hope voters teach them a lesson. I'm not asking for voters to like, change whole government. No, no. Teach them a lesson now because when we don't teach them a lesson, you know what message we're sending? We're telling those who hold the echelons of power, Our voters don't care about this, they don't care about corruption. They don't care. So after this, after I drop 47 criminal charges, there are many more in line, I'll drop them all. The voters will still vote me in. I mean, just look at it, right? During the weekend, only after the Pulai and Sempang Jeram by election in which PHBN won, then Zahid had the confidence and DAP had the confidence to also invite Zahid to go to the General Assembly where he received a standing ovation. Trust me, the result was different 
and voters taught them a lesson, then that would not have happened. I still think the government would not fall, but that definitely would not have happened. They'll be a lot more careful after this. Then there'll be those in government saying, hey, we cannot do this. If we do this, we're going to lose our seats. Now, when we don't teach them a lesson, it is okay. Voters accept it. We can do whatever we want. It starts with this. After this, there'll be a lot more. Where's the end to it? But so I want to ask voters, are you okay with that? And I have to respect the will of the voters, but I'm hoping that you will see what I see because my fear is that we are normalizing corruption for good, not just in this government, but in future governments and for future generations to be thought that as long as I hold political leverage, I can steal as much as I want. So, actually, the truth is, when I was looking at some of the reports uh, when it comes to the two elections, right, uh, it was said that while PHBN actually won, the voter turnout rate was a little bit low, and actually, on PN side, there was a huge increase in votes. Mm despite the fact there were 9,000 votes increase. So it seems like there are some changes at the grassroots level at this very point, uh, maybe going undetected, yeah. but I think it's something that the current government will definitely need to take a look into. Yeah. But having said that, going back into your decision that you have made to leave the current government, yeah. I bet you actually waited out the pros and cons, and you have said it all, a lot of it just now in, in, in the whole batch, right? But I want to delve a little bit deeper into it, where if you would have just made the decision to just keep quiet and just pick up a little bit but not make a drastic decision of leaving, some people actually felt that you maybe you've just pick up and then stayed there, right? What do you see are the consequences of it? Definitely, you have thought a lot yeah. more deeper into it. So what do you think Definitely. is the consequence? To be honest, initially I thought that would be the best move. Speak out, get my views out, get my stance out and then just shut up yeah. and sit comfortably in government. So much where location, I'll get that 3.8 3. Yeah. million ringgit allocation <laughs> while opposition gets zero. Hey, we just lost 3.8 million allocation for to run any of those development that you've been talking about. Yeah. So why? But that was the same thing in 2020. My friend, in 2020, so people said, Sadiq, you got your views out enough. Right? And then just work from within. Be the voice of check and balance from within. Wouldn't I be the biggest hypocrite as one too? If I do not make this move, what is that wake-up call to the government? Right. I mean, they'll be like, there are no consequences. I can do whatever I want. I can drop as many criminal charges. I can forget reforms. It is okay. I am invincible. Well, that's no longer the case. Even if this small move for me, that's only one. Mind you, I mean, I, and I see people, I mean, I don't know whether to follow the state of our politics saying, oh my God, if government doesn't drop these criminal charges, then government will fall. You've got to be kidding me, right? Where can Zahid go? I mean, where can I'm not go? I mean, you think they're suddenly going to go to PN? PN didn't drop their criminal charges. PN didn't appoint him as deputy prime minister. This government appointed him as deputy prime minister. That is a lot more already than what PN did. I mean, in the end, just allow the court to, to play its role. And if he gets acquitted by the court, he says it's a very strong defence. That's even better for the country and for him and for the coalition. I just want to share something. People keep on talking about this green wave. Firstly, I think it's not a green wave. It is a wave of dissatisfaction, a wave against corruption. But you know, even if there is a green wave, you know what fits into this green wave? What happened last week? Because Malays are pissed off. Malays like me. I'm bloody pissed off. My family is pissed off. My friends are pissed off. We were all PH supporters. Because when you do this, it is confirming that ah, we want to normalise corruption. It is okay. This is the only kind of Malay leadership which can exist. It is okay. That's what fits in to the so-called green wave. Look at the Middle East. What led to the collapse of dictatorships what led to the collapse of monarchies? What led to the collapse of democratic governments? It was often because of rampant corruption and the normalisation of corruption. What happened then? Islamists took over. You look at Egypt. You look at Afghanistan. I mean, when the Taliban took over, previously, the democratic government then was rife with corruption from top to bottom. I don't want that to happen to Malaysia, but how do you ensure that that doesn't happen in Malaysia? You show that you are a democratic, multiracial, competent, clean government. The more you do this, the more people get pissed off and you feed into that green wave because it shows. Sadly, people think, ah, when democracy and governance fails, what do I rely on? Things which I can easily relate. Race and religion. I don't want that. I want that middle ground. But what is happening today is feeding into it. And trust me, the more this happens, the more you will fit into it. And what's worse, my friend, if in this particular context, a takeover happens, 
you will see an ultimately polarised Malaysia because people will no longer trust reforms, people will no longer trust you, you are hypocrite and that's the end of reforms. I mean, can you just imagine now after this? Let's say in a few years' time, election takes place, opposition takes over. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about PM. And then, Paige wants to go on the streets, all oh, reforms against corruption. I mean, I'm telling you, the Malays who abandoned completely, now it's already happening. 80% of Malays. 80%. In Johor, the bastion of Amlo, 70%. That means out of, in a room of 10 Malays, 7 left. In Kedah, almost 9 out of 10. And these are not my numbers, these are actual analysts and experts saying. In Johor recently, Bridget Walsh, 7 out of 10, 68 to 69% of Malays. So you've lost the Malays. I know that in time, because if this continues and the normalisation of corruption continues, you will lose all Malaysians. But while I say this, PN needs to wake up and be a better opposition. And they come, oh, why are the Chinese and Indians not wanting to back us? Why do they still back PN? Eh, corruption is horrible, but playing race and religion, toxicity and divisive is also horrible. Yeah. So you cannot, that's why I say, on this end, it is highly polarised. And I think it's time for us to go back to the centre. Have a competent, democratic, multiracial coalition which looks on changing and resetting Malaysia for good. If not, we will be in big, big trouble. Just a last question before I go into some of the questions that I've collected from the public. Hearing from you just now as well, uh, it went ahead into something that I never thought about, which is, what about the next election? What are you going to call for? What kind of... Because the last few rounds was all about reformacy and fighting against corruption. And when you planted or giving people that seed of doubt mm. that this is not handled well, yeah. then it becomes not credible yeah. for you to call the same kind of slogan once again, yeah. right? Uh, that's something I really never thought about, right? And I thought that's very true. And that requires people to actually speak up, stand up, yeah. and actually go against it. Now, I also think that you, you made a very interesting decision in the sense that the moment you say you leave uh, the current government, you actually say that, I'm still going to give all my support. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, you don't have to buy me over with anything, I'm still going to support you. I just want to speak up and make a very clear stance. Yeah. So it makes everyone start wondering, like, what is the future ahead for Muda? What is the future ahead for Sadiq? Because as far as fact-based is concerned, you did not come out and say, come, I'm going to make a move. Now it's your work to buy me over, to convince me to vote for your policy once again. Instead, you walk off with that. I'm still going to support all the good policies, uh, but I'm just going to walk off from this. Yeah. So... What's the plan, actually? I, what's the end goal of this? Yeah. I mean, I remember when the move was made, or in that week of consideration, there were top leaders of AMNO who said, if you dare leave. PH leaders said, if you dare leave. And when I left, they were like, oh no, don't leave. <laughs> and worse, they said, ah, Sadiq left only because he wants to renegotiate yeah. better positions in government. Eh, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. If I wanted to negotiate, I'll negotiate in government, not outside. <laughs> <laughs> and really, if I'm driven by positions, heck, in 2020, that's a ministerial position, not some random agency or GLC. I'm not driven by posts. And I think by now, a lot of those who know me know that that's not my motivation. But to me, that principal path is very important. Because put aside politics, I cannot sleep at night knowing that I've committed a grave sin in normalising corruption in Malaysia. And worse, again, sending that precedent for future generations that with power comes everything. And that's not right. So what's the way forward for Muda? Yes, I'm alone in parliament. It's a very lonely path. I mean, if you look at my seat in parliament, I mean, it's really at the back and it's empty. This empty lot. Usually to my left, to right, in front, back, it's packed, you know. Now it's like to my left, right, front, back, no one. Not just no one, even to their side, left, right, right no one. But it means I can put, I can bring more stuff, lah, because uh, it's all, all the tables are empty. Uh, but this is the beginning. I mean, if you look at other parties, including PKR, they started with one seat. And for Muda, we have a long way to go. But as long as we stick to our, our ideals, I call it pragmatic idealists. I mean, you can't just be blind idealists, pragmatic idealists. You make sure that you defend the line of multiracial, institutional reforms, um, and really making Malaysia a developed country, I think we'll be on the right path. We need to get more young leaders with ideas to strengthen institutions which will create a political structure, no matter who is in power, no matter which party wins, Malaysia will be on the right footing. That's what a developed country is about. 
And that's my dream. I want to see Malaysia go down this path. So yeah, the road ahead will be lonely and tough, but we have to toughen up because only tough people can run Malaysian politics. So let me just bring out some of the questions that I've been getting from uh, my audience. Uh, let's start with something very, very light and uh, a little bit more fun, just to kickstart. Bila nak kawin? Any answer to that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is one of the only questions this is a damn random question which, I cannot, movie, which eh? I cannot answer. You know what? <laughs> Many reporters and interviews where the mainstream or alternative <laughs> press have asked me some of the toughest questions, you know. But when asked about this, is one like, I really can answer. So <laughs> let's uh, end it at that. When, uh, when the time is right, the time is right. So pray that I'll get uh, the right person and I also become the right person for that lady. Because it, it is a pairing after all. <laughs> all right. So let's go into more serious question right now. During this whole period, you also commented that DAP is a lap dog, mm. right? Not sure it's taken out of context or anything, mm. but there was a comment that was putting on the media. Mm. Don't you think it's a little bit overboard? Mm. And what do you think your colleagues at DAP who used to fight alongside you mm. feel about this? I think, again, people forget the word. It's not about dog. <laughs> the word essentially means tipper alatkan, which is being used. And I see exactly that. It is being used. Because prior to election, it was DAP who campaigned hard on the anti-corruption ground. Heck, many of the MPs today said, we win, we put him in jail. <laughs> Instead, we win, we make him the deputy prime minister, we are the ones who drop the charges. So isn't that the best example to show how you are being used? I mean, if that's not it, I do not know what else I can explain. I mean, just put it this way, can you imagine in 2018, we say, oh, fight one MDB, and then after the election, we say, it's okay, let's be friends, forget things for political convenience. Heck, now we have a bigger majority than 2018, by the way. To me, it's, the word is about being used. Uh, similarly, how people, you know, Irene, you say, oh my god, how can you say this? Every day I'm being called a lapdog, by the way. You just say it's so many different masters. It's Tone, it's Tantri Mudin, it's Tundaim, it's so many. <laughs> you, you see me going, oh my god, how could you call me that? Because I know what it means. I mean, come on guys, English, right? I mean, we know what it means. It means I'm being used. None of them knew my decision, by the way. I didn't consult them. I have not seen them in a very, very long time. That's why this decision really caught everyone by surprise. I mean, including government, including my close friends, my family. Yeah. Because it took a while, I really thought this through. And it's not about them, it is about the country. It's about my conscience, it's about Muda's conscience. So, but when they call me all this lap dog, choo choo, I mean, you see me get, oh, just focus on the word. You know the funny part? Huh? They were so focused on responding to my comment instead of speaking up against the 47 corruption charges which were dropped. They were silent, silenced, bisu, when the corruption charges were dropped. And when I made a comment, everyone came out. I'm like, come on, who's your real enemy? Mm. Who is your real enemy? Is it corruption or is it Said Sadiq? And friends in DAP, I still call them friends, know what I've done. Hey, if I wanted to play safe in 2020, I would have just abandoned this principled path. I forget you, forget friendship, became a minister, comfortable. Most likely, will still win my seat in Moa. Bersatu won huge in Pago. It's just neighbouring. They said then, oh, betraying the mandate, people will punish Bersatu. Bersatu from having 11 to 13 seats now have 35. I mean, that says a lot. But is it just about winning? Did I make that move just because I wanted to win? Hell no, I knew that it would be much harder to win. Moa is a ridiculously tough two-thirds Malay majority seat. 69 to 70% Malay majority. So it's okay, I'll fight it out. If I lose, I lose. And after that, me and my family getting threatened. We don't have to go for it. The DAP leaders know what my case is about and how much threats I receive for one year and a half before the charge happened. Heck, in this very table, my friend, here, right before I got charged, the SPRM officer came and said, this is your final chance to sign the SD, support Tan Sri Muhyiddin's government. I can say this now because this is in court. And if I lie in court, I can be charged. Because we have the audio, so it's in court. I didn't budge. I fought on. Say, you want to charge me if I do anything wrong? Jail me. I know I'm not wrong, I'll fight you in court. I mean, that's what politics of principles is about. And yet today, they forget the people who actually called them racist, the people who play on sentiment saying that DAP wants to destroy Islam, Malaysia. So I'm no, this was Zaid Hamidi then. I didn't say this. We have been saying that for decades. Now, oh, they put him up, standing ovation, cheers, immediately after they together drop the 47 corruption charges. It's okay, my conscience is clear. 
If they want to attack me, feel free. This is a democracy. But I'm pretty sure deep down they know why I made this decision because they were with me in 2020, they were with me in 2021 and 2022 when I and my family were threatened all the way. If there's any last thing that you want to say uh, to your colleagues at DAP right, regarding to this, uh, what would it be before we move on to the next question? Because during this time, I think one thing I would just want to tap on and follow up a little bit of it is the fact that um, during this parliament sitting, um, MPs raised up that they want to discuss about Zahid's case, mm. but it was dismissed. You were not allowed to discuss it during parliamentary sitting. And this became something that uh, a lot of people say oddly similar to the 1MDB issue itself. Yeah. yeah. But no one really yeah. spoke up except the opposition side. So what are your thoughts on this? And is there anything that you want to say to those people who used to fight alongside with you? I just hope that they'll find their voice again and they know that, or they'll soon know that I'm not their enemy. And I don't know, in a matter of time, they'll realise who their true enemies are. And by then, it may already be too late, but it's okay. Hopefully, that will be a reminder. Uh, similarly, how I warned Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassid in 2020 that engineering the Sheraton move means that your new allies will end up backstabbing you when the time comes. And it happened. When he didn't want to drop the corruption charges against Zahid and the colleagues, they pulled their support and the government fell. I think today, in a matter of time, things like that will happen. It's not because of Syed Sadiq, but it's because of being unprincipled in politics and being too Machiavellian to a point that you forget your true voice. So I hope they find their true voice. I wish them all the best. And uh, I think soon they'll realise who their true enemy is. One more question here. Um, someone actually commented this. It's always the lesser evil, never the ideal situation when it comes to politics. What do you think? Yes or no? And please elaborate. I mean, I remember people keep on telling me this lesser evil from 2020, you know. I mean, that's why I keep on saying. <laughs> but what is that lesser evil? People think that it is between two extremes. Is that you have to drop all the criminal charges. If not, the PN Islamic radicalism wave will come in. Guys, it's not that extreme. There is a middle path, which is, you have appointed Datuk Sri Zaid as the Deputy Prime Minister. AMNO is already part of your government. Heck, you have a two-third majority, 148 seats. Remind, I want to remind you, when it was under Tan Sri Muddin, Ismail Sabri, the majority was only about three. Now the majority is like what? 30, 40 additional MPs. So let's say Zahid can command 10 MPs to pull out, which I find it hard because if he wants to pull out now because of his corruption case, he cannot. <laughs> and people will see it. Back then, he could. Because even though he pulls out 10, government fell. Now, even if he pulls out 10, government will have like, what, 130 MPs left. It's not that easy. So the point I'm trying to make is, fine, the lesser of evil is working with Amno. Right? That's the lesser of evil working with Amno. But it is not about dropping criminal charges. It is not about normalizing corruption. It is not about abandoning reforms. That will send a precedent for future generations to come. And when that happens, mind you, this will be a precedent. Any aspiring prime minister will see this and will use this as a precedent. And it will be a reform-led era which will be the precedent to normalise corruption. If the reform-led Prime Minister could do it, why can't I 20 years down the road? Is that what we want for Malaysia? Heck, in Singapore, I mean, just not, not even charge, small. I mean, already full resignation, biggest issue of the year in the UK. UK, you know, we say, we make fun of the UK. Just caught lying in Parliament. Step down. Caught lying in Parliament in Malaysia. That means every day we have to step down <laughs> if we apply that standard. I mean, yeah. so they just find some MPs for having affairs as well, right? Yeah, yeah even yeah. personal matters. Yeah. The point is, what kind of a democracy do we want to build? I want Malaysia to become a developed country and every single action which I do today will impact the future of Malaysia whether positive or negative. Right. So I want to leave the best place. I admit I make my fair share of mistakes and I've owned up to it, I've apologised for it. But in 2020, if I were given a chance to go back into time, would I make the same move? I would. Even if it means losing my ministerial position, even if it means be, me being charged. Today, would I do the same move? I will. Because it's not just about what will happen in the next two years, the less of evil in the next two years. To me, it's the less of evil for the next 20 years when I want Malaysia to become a developed country. Right. So can I say that your opinion of that is, yes, there is that lesser evil exists, but there are certain lines you don't cross. Correct. And that's the red line they talked about. Because I know why they're saying the less of evil, because they think that if we don't do this, government will fall. It will not. It will not. If the government only has three to five M majority MPs like Tan Sri Muhyiddin and Ismail Sabri, yes. They should be very, very worried. The government has 148. 
148. So please don't use this as an excuse and it's irresponsible and a blatant lie to say this. Trust me, you do this, it will make it even easier and more fragile for the government to fall. Uh, to fall. Like I told you how doing this, even if there's a wind, green wave, even though I think it's a wave of dissatisfaction, especially among the Malays, you will make that wave of dissatisfaction even worse. Trust me. And we've seen it. Pulai, you pointed it out. PN got a larger vote share, even though that being a non-Malay majority seat. I mean, AMLO have lost control over the Malays. And now PN have taken over. With this, I mean, we know the answer. And I'm very worried of Malaysia's future. However, I will do whatever it takes to put us back on the right path. The final question, before I end this so that you can head to the parliament. Right now, the opinion towards you, your decision, is very polarised. From what I've read on social media and seen the comment, it's either they think you're a crybaby who doesn't get what you want and then you're just gonna do whatever it takes to get the attention that you need, right? People dislike this decision, I'll put it that way. And there's the other side of the camp where they believe in your principles and they say this is a great move. Regardless of what, you have stand on a principle and you have lived up to the expectation and you should do that as an MP. So to these two groups of people, what is the thing that you will say to them? For the first one, the ones who disagree with your opinion, uh, disagree with your decision, and they're throwing in all sorts of criticism, yeah, what will you say to them? And the other group, where they think that, yeah, great, this is a great cause, I believe in it, yeah. what will you say to them? To those who disagree, I respect their views. If anything, I think in time you'll realise why I made this move. Similarly, how many of those who lambasted my decision in 2020 understood why I made that move as well, that principled move. And if I were to make mistakes down the line, continue to criticise me. Because the last thing which I want is to be arrogant, hot-headed, wearing that veneer of invincibility. What's happening today is because of that. People forget who elected them and why they got into power, what platform they fought for, which led to people electing them. So, to be honest, I respect your views. Hopefully, through this interview, you will realise why I made that move. Rest assured, it's not because of money. I mean, as you all know, if government 3.8 million, opposition zero, I mean, if it's about money, I'm stupid, right? And if it's about positions, 2020 minister GLC position, so much better. So, clearly it's not about money imposed. You know, you may think that I'm too idealistic, which is fair, and that's a fair criticism. But trust me, it took me a while to arrive to this decision. But after listening to this interview, if you still disagree, I respect your views. Uh, politics is not about winning over everyone. Politics is not about being a populist. Politics is about nation building. Uh, and I think my heart is in the right place. For those who agree with me, I hope you will continue to scrutinise my actions. Because moving forward, I'll make my fair share of mistakes. Uh, and I want to be scrutinised because that level of scrutiny makes me a better leader. And I hope that this principled path will be carried out by many others. Share this message to friends and family members who may have a different opinion. At least let them hear of our opinion that this is a principled move and we need to speak up, we need to draw red lines so that people realise that tolerating corruption, normalising corruption will destroy our country whether in this generation or the other. I hope we will stand united and stronger together. One more question for our audience is this. Since you choose to leave the existing government right now, right, shouldn't you vacate the seat in Moa and stand up for an election again? Yeah. I see a lot of friends from PH asking me to do so. The irony is, we have to remember what is the public mandate. We keep on saying, mandat rakyat, mandat rakyat, mandat rakyat. Remember in 2020, yep. when they changed government, they say, mandat rakyat. What was the people's mandate which led us to being elected? In last election, we campaign on the ground of anti-corruption. We campaign on the ground of reforms. They campaign on the ground of jailing Zahid. I didn't. I said, follow the law. I didn't. There are many speeches where they said, menang esok penjarakan Zahid. I didn't say that. Huh? I didn't go that far because I want to follow the rule of law. And today when we are elected, we do the opposite of all of those. <laughs> I mean, uh, so who really betrayed the public? Who forgot the mandate which led us to being elected? So I want to ask a question. Let's say we have a time issue and we go back November last year during election. And I campaign on this ground. If I win, I will drop all 47 charges from Zaid Amidi. I will forget the anti-corruption anti -corruption platform, put back reforms. Will I be elected in MOA? Hell no. 
Heck, I may even lose my deposit. So the point of the matter is, never forget why the public voted us in. And if I were to be put to this standard, oh, I must vacate my seat, then they must vacate their seat as well because the voters vote them, vote them in to drop criminal charges. The voters vote them in to work with BN. The voters vote them in for ABC. No. So, I mean, clearly, that's why I said, please buy a mirror and look, look in the mirror. It's not a personal attack, no, because if you're putting me on this standard, let's put all of us on the same standard. But I just point out this big hypocrisy. Eh? That's why I say, in the end, it's not about the past, it's not about what you did, it's always about how convenient you are today. You know, at the beginning of this government, they took over, I think, about four to five Bersatu MPs from Sabah, right? They hopped, they joined government. Oh, they didn't ask at all. <laughs> they defended them. Oh, it's okay. I said, said it, campaign under Muda's flag. Use Muda's flag. <laughs> Campaign on anti-corruption, now holding on to the same platform before, during and after election. Oh, I must vacate. Satu guys, oh, it's okay because now they are with us. It's okay. I mean, seriously, guys. <laughs> I think that answers itself. Lah. Another one more question that people are asking. Uh, after leading, leaving the PH Alliance, yeah. right? Do you think you are still confident in winning the MOA seat again? It will not be easy. And to be honest, I know it will be a Herculean task. Herculean. We have four years to go. But I have a strong feeling that people in Moa want someone who's principled, who dares to fight a good fight no matter what sacrifices are needed. If not, they would not have re-elected me the second time. I mean, when I talk about resources, when I was in opposition, Moa was left with zero ringgit. I fought hard to fundraise millions for Moa through many initiatives, Botak Challenge, teaching tuition, selling my mom's cooking, I mean, doing kurta for raya, name it. But they understood and they gave me another chance. While it was tough, they still did. But let's take the worst case scenario. Let's say four years from now, I'm to lose GE. I mean, I have to accept that that's the people's calling. Does that mean just because there's a fear of losing, I would do something else today? No. Because remember, don't just look at politics from a one electoral lens. Biden lost many times. I have to go far, look at Malaysia. Datuk Sri Anwar, <laughs> the Prime Minister today took, what, 20 years. It's not about what happens in this election. It's about how you invest in the future of Malaysia for decades to come. So if I am destined to lose, it is okay. That is the people's decision and I will respect that. And if that happens, it's okay. I can focus on Muda, I can focus on my business. I can focus on being a teacher. I've always wanted to be a lecturer. Before I joined politics, I was a lecturer. I have done my studies in the NUS, Lee Kuan Yew School of Government. I want to go back um, to do my studies in Oxford University in public policy. I want to do so many things. And you know, trust me, it is so much calmer and better. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if it is destined that way, let it be. Thank you very much for your time, Thank YB. You so, you. Uh, hope you enjoyed the we breakfast later. Yet. We haven't even eaten yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And hope to have a good day at Parliament today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. See Pleasure. you. <laughs>